Let's All do right. it. Sister Damien, if you want to stir us off, that'd be great. Sure, sure. Well, good evening, everyone. I, I think we're in for a real treat tonight, as long as we can get all the technology to work. <laughs> um, my name is Sister Damien Marie Savino, and I'm the Dean of Science and Sustainability at Aquinas College in Grand Rapids. And I'm pleased to welcome you to this year's Your Health Lecture, which will focus on stroke pathophysiology and treatment. As some of you may know, at Aquinas College, we recently completed an expansion and renovation of our science facilities and are now settled into a beautiful new state-of-the-art science building. We hope to be able to welcome you all to our new building in person next year <laughs> for this lecture and to share with you our process of moving into a new future for the college in terms of science and health education. We're really happy to partner with MSU in this Your Health lecture series. This series is a unique educational partnership between Aquinas College and the Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. The goal of the series is to feature physicians and researchers who can speak on a wide variety of topics of interest to public audiences. When we can meet in person, the speaker meets with pre-med students prior to the public lecture. Additionally, Aquinas College pre-med students usually have the opportunity to take part in a round table discussion with MSU College of Human Medicine students, and they always love that. I'd like to thank Mark Briv in a particular way for working on organizing this event and taking on all the stress of getting the technology to come together. So Mark, I'll pass it on to you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sister Damien. And, and as you said, uh, we obviously plan to be in person and to provide the virtual option. Um, I, I believe I had a nice tour uh, from you of the new facility a, a couple of years back. And yeah, my hope is definitely in 2023 that we can uh, be there in person with you. So um, as Sister Damien mentioned, my name is Mark Brevi. I'm the Director of Community and Government Relations at Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. Uh, MSU College of Human Medicine and Aquinas College have been collaborating on the Your Health Lecture Series for at least the past 10 years as an extension of the Early Assurance Program Agreement between our two schools. I want to thank Sister Damien and Aquinas College for conti the continuing partnership. I would like to note that at the conclusion of Dr. Usama's uh, presentation, he will answer questions written into the Q&A feature for as long as time allows. I will uh, hop back on at the end and uh, help him out with that. And with that, I would like to introduce our speaker this evening. Uh, Dr. Adam Ustama is Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine and Director of Neurological Emergency Medicine Research at Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. He earned a medical degree from Wayne State University School of Medicine and completed his, his completed an, an emergency medicine residency with the Grand Rapids Medical Education Partners. Dr. Ustama currently practices emergency medicine at Spectrum Health Butterworth Hospital in Grand Rapids and Spectrum Health Gerber Memorial Hospital in rural Nuevo County. Dr. Ustama's research interests include the diagnosis and treatment of transient ischemia attack and stroke, as well as pre-hospital medicine and the application of research evidence to clinical practice. With that, Dr. Ustama. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you everyone for logging into a webinar to, to hear me. Um, when you're writing a talk like this, uh, it's very useful to know who your audience is. And so since I have no idea uh, who's out there or who's listening, hopefully I've written something that you're interested in spending an hour with me on. Uh, but in any case, uh, yeah, so I, I'm an emergency physician and my interest is in the area of stroke. And so for this uh, talk of general interest, um, my slides that I'd given a few years ago, I looked at and I thought, you know, this talk is really kind of boring. So I, uh, I revamped it. So this is all, all new material. And I decided to look at stroke outcomes and treatment sort of from a much broader 30,000 foot view. Um, uh, and so we're gonna we're gonna kind of take a tour of the history of stroke treatment uh, tonight, and uh, hopefully, hopefully it'll be interesting to you. Uh, okay, so uh, stroke, as you have no doubt, is a common and a bad problem. Uh, there are 
uh, numerous examples of uh, famous people who've passed away from stroke. Uh, I've collected just a handful of them here. Uh, interestingly, all three, Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin died of strokes uh, after World War II. Um, and I imagine that there's probably someone in your life who, uh, who you know, who, who, has been ex who has been affected by a stroke. And uh, so it's a common problem, it's a bad problem. If you look at the United States as a whole, uh, it also is a problem that is more intense in the Midwest uh, and, uh, and particularly the Southern Midwest. Um, but uh, death, rates, death rates in our area of the country are a little higher than they are in other parts. Uh, and if you look at our country as a whole, stroke is the fifth leading cause of death, at least it was before COVID-19. Um, it's actually fallen in recent years, and that's one of the things we're going to be talking about as we kind of look at the arc of stroke care and stroke treatment that's happened over the uh, over the centuries. So I'm I'm going to sort of take a step back, and we're going to kind of trace the history of stroke going all the way back to uh, all the way back to antiquity, and we're going to kind of follow through ideas of stroke uh, as they've evolved over time, and then I'm going to try to put recent developments. Uh, into that context and talk a little bit about how things have changed just in the last 20 years. So um, going all the way back to the beginning, uh, the first kind of coherent medical description of, of a stroke-like syndrome comes from Hippocrates. So fitting that we would start at the beginning of medicine. Uh, Hippocrates sometime around 400 BC uh, used the term apoplexy, which apparently was, was uh, coined probably before him. Uh, and referred to kind of a constellation of symptoms, but certainly symptoms that we can recognize as stroke symptoms today. Uh, he made the observation that stroke was a disease that tended to occur uh, of later adulthood and older age. Um, he also uh, noted that attacks of numbness might precede a stroke, which was kind of an astute observation, and described <clears throat> this as kind of a quintessential example of stroke, when persons in good health suddenly uh, are seized by pains in the head and straight away are laid down speechless and breathe with stertor. They die in seven to 10 days when fever comes on. So um, not, not a bad description of an untreated stroke patient. Um, so Hippocrates uh, left us with some writings, but really the person who was perhaps most influential over, over medicine for about a millennium uh, was Galen. Galen was uh, a Greek physician heavily influenced by Hippocrates and had the same sort of concept of the physician philosopher. And so medicine in those days was very much grounded in philosophical ideas about the universe and about the soul and about uh, how people functioned. And so uh, he practiced in Rome, uh, rose to great prominence there as a clinician during one of the plagues, and was the personal physician to a number of the emperors of Rome. Uh, and he was a scientist in addition to being a philosopher. He uh, was uh, known for performing careful dissections of various animals, including primates, in order to try to uh, develop understandings of anatomy, and from that anatomy and from his philosophy sort of divine uh, the underlying physiology that drove health and disease. And in addition to being an amazing physician of the day, was also just a prolific writer. And uh, perhaps that reason more than any other is why his writing served as essentially the foundation of medicine throughout the entire Middle Ages. And so, um, in Galen's understanding and Hippocrates' understanding of human physiology, uh, health and disease were the balance of uh, humors, fluids within the body. And uh, uh, health and disease, uh, health was the, was the balance of these humors and disease was characterized by imbalance, too much of one or another of these elements. Uh, and so the, uh, the elements of disease that he described were uh, blood, uh, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm. And each humor kind of had a home in an organ. So phlegm was uh, within the brain and represented water. Uh, blood was, uh, uh, was located within the heart or started within the heart and, uh, and, represented, um, and represented air. The uh, black bile was supposedly created by the spleen. 
and yellow bile by the liver. And each of them kind of had a disposition uh, associated with them. And you can see in the names here that the, that the disposition names still sort of represent moods today. So sanguine, melancholic, choleric uh, refer, to, uh, refer to moods that we still uh, use that terminology for, even if we've lost the, the humoral interpretation of them. And so in his understanding of physiology, uh, the way that life worked was we would breathe the pneuma or the sort of essential elements uh, into our bodies through our lungs. And we would eat food and then our liver would process the natural spirits of the food. And we would breathe in the pneuma, which would then aliven those spirits into something he called vital spirit, which is what our heart distributed to our body. And, uh, and when that went to the brain, then it was converted into action. Uh, which he called animal spirit. And so in his uh, concept of the disease of stroke, uh, he, he viewed this as a problem of the brain, which is actually reasonably astute when, uh, when we sort of look at this now, he may have had some of the details wrong, but some of the basic concept was actually, was actually pretty close. Um, so the, he, he saw the disease as being a disease of the brain, and it was his belief that uh, uh, phlegm would build up in the cerebral ventricles and that cold would sort of thicken or coagulate the blood and block the flow of animal spirit or, or activity into the body, uh, which would then explain the palsy and sensory dysfunctions that, that we see clinically with strokes. And so this really was kind of the foundational understanding of what a stroke was. And because all the four humors interacted with heat, cold, moist, and dryness, this was a disease of of cold, too much cold and too much moisture. Uh, and so uh, this sort of worldview kind of dominated the way strokes were, were thought about and treated throughout the Middle Ages. Uh, and so during the same time, uh, Shakespeare noted uh, uh, one of the active debates, which was whether or not the sort of seat of the, of the soul or human consciousness was in the brain or, or, in, the, uh, or in the heart. Um, so during the Middle Ages, um, in some sense, not a lot of progress was made, or at least progress as we might define it. Um, but that doesn't mean nothing was going on. In each uh, of the sort of major epochs of the Middle Ages, the, the teachings of, uh, of Galen were kind of uh, viewed as a, a central bedrock. And it was actually not scholarly to challenge or try to make your own observations, but rather to study and understand and apply these principles in clinical practice. Um, in the first portion of the Middle Ages, uh, his uh, teachings spread through the Byzantine Empire and then were picked up uh, during the Golden Age of Islam by a number of prominent Islamic physicians who really did carry the banner of the Galenic medicine uh, for several hundred years. And um, although the sort of underlying theories remain fairly constant during that time, uh, added uh, a great deal of clinical observation and published a number of comprehensive encyclopedias of medicine, kind of uh, building on the pharmacopoeia that was handed down from Galen and, and things like that. And so uh, contributions to stroke included a very clear kind of a clinical description of a, of a stroke, uh, and so characterized by sudden onset changes in neurological functioning, uh, potentially with a comatose state, loss of sensation, difficulty with swallowing or respirations, no fever, uh, and uh, a feeble pulse were, were kind of viewed as the quintessential symptoms of stroke. And uh, as toward the end of that period of time, there was even some differentiation uh, by Abyssinia, uh, which uh, took apoplexy and started to dissect the underlying etiology, maybe not to question it, but to, but to identify that maybe there was more than one type of stroke, which was actually a, a very good insight that ultimately uh, does have some correlation in reality. Another thing that was contributed during that same period of time was thinking about the brain rather than as one thing or as a conduit for spirits, thinking of the brain as something that had sections to it and those sections had different functions. Uh, it was noticed from early on, even in the days of uh, Hippocrates, that an injury on one side of the head might cause symptoms on the other side of the body. Uh, but this theory sort of went beyond that to say that there were portions of the brain that might be responsible for thought or memory or interpretation of images. 
And again, the neuroanatomy wasn't fully elucidated, but that general concept was, uh, was a step in the right direction. And so it's always interesting to read about kind of ancient remedies for various medical conditions. And um, so as, as you might imagine, a lot of this stuff probably uh, doesn't make much sense from our perspective, but uh, viewing it through the lens of the uh, understanding of stroke that they had, the treatment for stroke generally had to deal with the principle of opposites. If something was cold, you warm it. If something is moist, you dry it. And so the cures for stroke had to do with applying heat and dryness. And so uh, a number of different um, medicinal herbs and drugs of the day uh, were, were given for stroke, such as mustard or thyme or oregano. Uh, there were various poultices applied. And I, I came across one interesting anecdote of a physician in the 1300s who related a story of treating a woman with aphasia uh, with a drug called Theodoricon, which I couldn't even identify what that was. It seems to be lost to antiquity, but um, evidently the, the physician was called to the woman who had suffered a stroke and was comatose and not able to speak. And so this substance was applied uh, on the inside of the mouth and allowed the woman to wake up and uh, make a final statement and then die. So not super effective in terms of our outcome, but, uh, but uh, nevertheless, it appeared to have done something. Other things that were often recommended by physicians of the day included dietary changes. Uh, there was uh, part of Abyssinia's text uh, that suggested that stroke victims should uh, rest after they eat uh, or that um, they should have dried figs and dried bread rather than moist uh, things to drink so that they wouldn't worsen their stroke. And the most extreme of these treatments was uh, cauterization, which was recommended for the apoplectic who was not responding to the other therapies. Uh, the treatment was to cauterize portions of the head with the hope that the hot, dry uh, cauterization would uh, counteract the uh, mucus that was causing the stroke. So um, as time wore on, then uh, obviously things uh, in a lot of different parts of science and uh, thinking changed dramatically as the Renaissance began. And, uh, and medicine was obviously one of, the, uh, one of the major areas that began to get new attention. And part of that new attention really had to do with uh, individuals begin looking for their, uh, for their own answers rather than merely relying on what was accepted as dogma uh, with regard to human physiology and anatomy. And so one of the major figures uh, of the late uh, Renaissance who contributed a great deal to the understanding of the anatomy of the brain was Thomas Willis, uh, who was a professor at Oxford, a student there first and later a professor, um, also a practicing physician. And uh, his great contribution was in delineating cerebral and cerebrovascular anatomy. Uh, he undertook very meticulous studies and there's some excellent uh, reproductions of his uh, drawings and notations from those dissections. He developed also a method for preserving brain tissue as it tends to decompose quickly after death in order to study it. And perhaps the most famous application of his knowledge is uh, the discovery of what's called the circle of Willis. Uh, so depending on your anatomy training, you may be aware that there's four uh, arteries that feed our brain, two in the front, the carotid arteries, and two in the back, the vertebral arteries. And up in the brainstem, those four arteries uh, feed into an interconnected series of vessels that become the cerebral circulation. So there's anterior, circuit, anterior cerebral arteries, middle cerebral arteries, and posterior cerebral arteries. And all of those arteries are connected by small communicating arteries. And uh, Willis correctly assumed that these redundant circulations were intended uh, to help the body respond to blockages of any one vessel. Uh, and so, uh, other important discoveries of, uh, of Thomas Willis included uh, differentiating between the cortex and the gray matter, uh, or in the white matter of the brain, and sort of surmising that there must be difference in function and correctly locating higher order of functioning to the cerebral cortex. Um, another big figure uh, during that same period of time was Johann Jakob Wepfer, who was a Swiss physician and uh, performed fairly uh, 
meticulous dissections of a series of patients who had died of apoplexia. And uh, those uh, dissections helped him make a number of good observations. The first one was that the problem was not something being stuck in the ventricles of the brain. In fact, uh, Willis had helped contribute to the uh, idea that those spaces were not the functional spaces of the brain. Uh, he also identified uh, blockages in the arteries of several victims, and in half of the victims, he identified bleeding. Uh, and so this might be considered the earliest kind of modern description of, uh, uh, of stroke pathophysiology. As the 19th century wore on, uh, a number of other figures began to move the ball forward. Uh, there was a, a physician named John Chain in Ireland uh, who uh, fairly painstakingly started to differentiate the many different symptoms that were kind of held under this big banner of apoplexy, which included anything from seizures and lethargy to unilateral weakness. And so by delineating that out, he really was kind of separating di distinct pathophysiological uh, entities. And uh, Jean-André uh, Rochot of France uh, was another physician who um, carried forward this tradition of uh, performing autopsies in order to correlate findings on postmortem examination to clinical symptoms. And his conclusion was that apoplexy should be limited only to those individuals who had a hemorrhage in their brain. Uh, John Abercrombie in Scotland uh, was the first to give a clear uh, distinct presentations of the three major types of stroke, uh, although he wasn't able to understand exactly why they were different. Uh, and of course, Rudolf Virchow uh, was a German physician who uh, greatly contributed to the understanding of thrombosis, uh, which of course is central to stroke in general. So moving into the 20th century now, uh, we're beginning to get a clearer picture of some distinct stroke syndromes, and we're starting to lose some of the um, misunderstandings of anatomy and physiology. But at this point, we're still mostly just correlating post-mortem examinations to clinical pictures. And so during the early 20th century, Charles Foy managed to um, provide very accurate descriptions of strokes that occur in specific cerebral arteries. Uh, and uh, another giant of clinical neurology from the 20th century was C. Miller Fisher, uh, who was a Canadian neurologist, uh, but later the chair of neurology at Harvard, uh, who was most known for his meticulous histories and kind of systematic uh, study of individuals with stroke. Uh, he helped establish what was called the, the Harvard Stroke Registry, uh, where he collected a bunch of uh, clinical information from different stroke survivors and was able to elucidate a number of different types of stroke syndromes, and also was among the first to identify the carotid artery stenosis as a potential source for those symptoms. He uh, was also the, the uh, uh, creator of the first stroke fellowship uh, in the 50s. Um, but perhaps the greatest contributions to neurology and stroke care in the 20th century or the most game-changing advances didn't necessarily come from medicine as much as they came from uh, physics. And uh, so in, uh, in the early part of the 20th century, Egan Moniz of uh, Portugal developed a technique of imaging uh, the cerebral blood vessels. So x-rays had been invented for some time, but they were mostly useful for looking at bones. Soft tissue things like the brain obviously don't show up on, an x on a plain x-ray. And so his idea was to identify brain tumors by essentially clamping off one of the carotid arteries in the neck, inserting a tube, and then injecting a radio-opaque dye, uh, a procedure now we would call cerebral angiogram. Unfortunately, some of the early attempts at performing this procedure led to severe disability as he caused a number of strokes and injected a few compounds that were directly harmful to patients. So it wasn't an unqualified success, but, um, but advanced considerably uh, our ability to determine the, the functional anatomy of the, of the cerebral arteries and the pathologies associated with them. Uh, Side note, Egas Moniz is also notable for developing the frontal lobotomy procedure that was used in psychiatry for some years. 
but I, I think maybe an even greater contribution to um, to the functional care and to the real-time diagnosis of stroke patients was Godfrey Hounsfield, uh, who is a British uh, electrical engineer who worked for the British uh, British electric, electric Musical Instrument Company or something like that. Uh, and uh, in the 1960s, he developed a concept of using x-rays shot from multiple angles and then using uh, a computer to reconstruct the images in such a way that you could essentially create a cross-sectional slice uh, through the human body. And so the first functioning CT machine was actually uh, built in a hospital in London in 1971 based on his work. Uh, so uh, just as an example of these two advances, this is a digital subtraction angiogram. So this is similar to what I was talking about where the dye is injected into the cerebral arteries. The, the, what you are looking at here is an advanced version of this where we've learned how to essentially uh, take the bone out of the x-ray. So using a subtraction technology, we shoot the x-ray before and after the dye, and then a computer can cancel out the uh, portions of the skull so that we're only looking at the vessels. Um, now, computed tomography has become ubiquitous in, in clinical practice of medicine for sure. And it is useful in all kinds of conditions, but perhaps neurological conditions were among the most uh, interesting early applications. So this is a picture of one of the first CT scan um, technologies that was available. And you can see it's highly pixelated. In effect, these x-rays were shot from multiple angles and then a computer calculated a density for each spot in space depending on how the x-ray is shot through the tissue. But even sort of squinting at this fairly pixelated image, you can see in this uh, right cerebral hemisphere, all CT scans are reversed as if you're looking up from a patient's foot. And this is their head as if it's sliced through like bread. Uh, and there's an area here in the right frontal lobe where there is clearly a tumor present there. So this was game changing for neurology, which up to that point had just basically been uh, careful and astute clinical evaluation of different nerve endings to try to infer what was going on in the brain. Now we could actually see it. Uh, and subsequent generations of CT scans provided much better detail. Uh, this looks like CT scans that I uh, looked at a bit in learning in medical school, but is actually technology that was pretty old even by then. Uh, and modern CT scans uh, have pretty fantastic resolution. And so you can identify gray and white matter, you can see sulci, you can see ventricles in the brain. Uh, and so what this technology allowed for is when a person had symptoms, we could now look inside their brain and we could state uh, with some confidence what exactly was going on there. And so out of that, grew our kind of modern understanding of, uh, of stroke, which broadly uh, kind of like apoplexy referred to a lot of different uh, symptoms for a long time. Stroke is kind of an unfortunate um, grandfathered in name that encompasses two very distinct pathophysiological processes that both share some symptoms. So it's brain damaged caused by a vascular problem. That's the commonality of stroke. Uh, but ischemic stroke is the version of stroke where the problem with the vessel is a blockage, usually a blood clot and or an atheroma uh, has, has allowed for the, the stoppage of blood flow. Whereas hemorrhagic stroke arises from the rupture of a blood vessel, be it from an aneurysm or high blood pressure or those kinds of things. So the presentation of these two distinct clinical entities prior to CAT scans was almost impossible to differentiate until a person had died. Uh, with the advent of CAT scans, we could now see blood. And so uh, we were able to break these two uh, types of stroke into their own branches. And so for the rest of this talk, I'm mostly gonna be just focusing on the ischemic stroke, which is by far the most likely type or the most common type of stroke. About 80 for 85% of strokes are caused by a blockage. Some of those blockages uh, are things that develop right within the space that's blocked. So for example, you have a little uh, atheromatous plaque that builds up in your artery. And then at some point that ruptures in, in a clot forms. A minority of strokes, about a third of those 
uh, are caused when a, a clot forms somewhere else, usually in the heart or in the carotid artery, and then travels to a spot somewhere in the brain. Hemorrhagic stroke uh, can also occur in two different ways. Uh, the first is to bleed within the brain, kind of as I've shown in this picture here. The substance of the brain is essentially pushed by bleeding. Uh, the other type of bleeding that can occur most often from an aneurysm is when the vessel ruptures somewhere outside of the brain's parenchyma. And that blood then travels in the fluid surrounding the brain called the cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, and we call that a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So the, the advances of the 20th century fall into a lot of different categories. Um, in general, what has happened over the course of the century is for, uh, for vascular diseases in general and for, spoke, for stroke in particular, things have gotten better. And this has been a trend really since about 1900. The, the mortality rate, meaning the number of people in the population that die of stroke has been slowly but steadily declining over that entire hundred years. And the reasons for that are broad. Um, during the uh, first half of the 20th century, medicine's greatest accomplishments really were more surrounding infectious disease, hygiene, public health, antibiotics. These types of things changed the way that people live and die in a, in a meaningful way such that cardiovascular diseases and cancers started to rise uh, in terms of the proportion portion of people who died from these conditions. Um, and so around the middle of the uh, middle and latter half of the 20th century, uh, systematic study of uh, large numbers of, of stroke patients allowed us to start to delineate what the risk factors were for developing stroke in a way that had never really been laid out well by the more anecdotal historical approach to stroke. And so big registries like the Harvard uh, Cooperative Stroke Registry that I mentioned before, the Framingham Registry, it might be something that you've heard of or learned about in the past. Uh, there was another one in Oxford, um, several scattered around the United States. And these large collections of patients allowed us to start to zero in on what it was that was leading to stroke so that we could focus on prevention. Uh, and so along those lines, uh, there was a great deal of interest in heart disease, which kills far more people, but it follows a very similar trend and has a lot of shared risk factors. And so as part of that, stroke benefited. So things like identification of hypertension and treatment of hypertension, which uh, hypertension as a risk factor, it seems like a given today, but it really wasn't until the 60s that it was identified as something that ought to be intervened on. And uh, not until the 70s and 80s that we really had good evidence to say that that, that, that worked. Uh, but development of antihypertensives and statins in the last half of the 20th century undoubtedly contributed to lower stroke incidence and therefore lower stroke deaths. Uh, the Surgeon General's report on smoking and subsequent efforts to stop smoking in the public have also been positive contributors to outcomes, no doubt. Uh, other drugs that have been developed specifically uh, for use in stroke include things like antiplatelet drugs, uh, understanding the role of aspirin in blocking clots, uh, anticoagulation drugs like warfarin um, were developed in the last half of the, uh, 20, of the 20th century and were able to uh, prevent stroke uh, in certain circumstances. And there was even a surgical preventative measure that was developed. Uh, I mentioned that C. Miller Fisher was among those who identified carotid plaque as one of the harbingers of a future stroke. And in the early 50s, Dr. Michael DeBakey performed the first carotid endarterectomy where a patient was having warning stroke symptoms and was taken to the operating room. And essentially they cut open the carotid artery, removed the plaque that was there, sewed it back up again, and the patient was cured, never had a problem. Uh, several other early attempts at that surgery did not have such good outcomes, but the first recorded uh, case actually turned out very well. But that uh, procedure became increasingly uh, common, especially into the 80s and 90s as a preventative measure for stroke. So these kind of preventative measure things uh, contributed greatly, but what about the people who actually had the strokes? Well, another uh, advance that I think uh, the 20th century can claim in its middle portions was an increased focus on better care uh, when patients suffer the disease. In effect, between the Middle Ages and the middle of the 20th century, uh, 
there really was next to nothing to do once a stroke occurred in terms of medical intervention. There were no drugs to give that worked, uh, but uh, there was an opportunity to provide better support to the individual who suffered the stroke. And so nursing interventions and changes during that period of time are likely responsible for some better stroke outcomes, things like preventing aspiration for individuals who can't swallow well after their stroke, um, changes in the way we handle head of bed, changes in toileting to prevent complications like urinary infections and bed sores. Uh, these things also extended patients' lives and uh, were big contributors into the development of distinct areas of the hospital that are designed to serve stroke patients. Uh, we now call those stroke units, um, but going back to the 1950s, general medical wards didn't necessarily differentiate. By the end of the 20th century, stroke units and, and stroke ICUs had uh, demonstrably improved outcomes as compared to people treated in other settings. So um, all these things together led to this decrease in incidence, uh, but those who suffered strokes still had bad outcomes. But by now we kind of understood what the problem was. This was a, a plumbing problem for 80%, 85% of people. And when you have a blockage, what do you wanna do? You wanna to try to dissolve that blockage. And so um, that led to the first major advance in stroke treatment or stroke therapy, which is built on uh, thrombolytic medications. So thrombolytics are drugs that activate the body's natural response to clots. When you form a clot, obviously it doesn't last in your body forever. You have uh, a substance that naturally occurs inside you called plasminogen, and there are several activators within your bloodstream that can turn it on. And when it turns on, it forms an enzyme called plasmin, which then degrades clot. So if you have a cut, your system clots for a while to stop the bleeding as the inflammatory process continues and you resolve the clot, you have a system for disassembling all that clot that was there and reestablishing normal tissue. So these drugs try to capitalize on that system to manipulate the body to break apart an offending clot, a clot somewhere we don't want. And the first of those that was identified is called streptokinase, discovered in 1933, and it's produced by the streptococcus bacterium. Uh, that's been tried for a number of different uh, conditions over the years, including for stroke. Uh, subsequently, there was another um, uh, thrombin or a plasmin activator called urokinase that was identified in kidney tissue. And in the 1950s, we specifically uh, attempted to do this for patients with stroke. And there were some small case series that identified that this could successfully dissolve clots in the cerebrovasculature. Uh, however, the outcomes were not good. Uh, the um, problem with activating plasmin, particularly if you do it indiscriminately, is that every clot in your body stops working. And when your brain is already damaged, uh, some of those clots were doing something useful. And so bleeding into the brain in other places uh, was a, a serious source of morbidity. So a couple of lessons were learned. One is um, the timing of treatment was important. And the second lesson was the type of patient was important. And the third uh, advance was developing a better thrombolytic. And that came in 1982 with the development of uh, the drug Ultaplase, which is a recombinant version in a, made in the lab version of the uh, uh, of the tissue plasminogen activator that we all produce naturally. And so that was developed in the 80s and opened a new door for potentially treating stroke. And so by this time, the model of stroke uh, had advanced a bit to where we started to uh, imagine that when a brain was being insulted by, by ischemia, it probably wasn't an all or nothing affair immediately. And so the concept goes something like this. If you uh, have a blood clot that develops in a particular artery. In a very short order, the neurons that are in that immediate area, which are extremely hungry for sugar and oxygen, begin to die. And, uh, and that's what we call a, a core infarct. Uh, but after the occlusion of that artery, there's likely a larger area that surrounds that initial area of infarct where collateral circulation is providing some amount of blood flow. And so the neurons maybe are starved a bit for blood, but are not in immediate uh, danger. Uh, 
And so we call that a penumbra or an, an area of reversible ischemia that might be salvaged if we can stop the process. Of course, over time, the longer stroke goes on, the more of the uh, core, uh, the more of the penumbra is taken over by core or irreversible neurologic damage. And unfortunately, when neurons are gone, they are gone. And so this kind of led to this idea that time is brain. Uh, every, it's been calculated that every minute the cerebral vessel occlusion continues, 1.9 million neurons die. Uh, and so there are a number of sort of extrapolations of this concept, but the bottom line was if we could get to patients early enough, perhaps by opening up blood flow, we could salvage some of the brain tissue that was insulted and it wouldn't proceed on to cell death, but would be able to recover. And so um, a series of trials were initiated to try to find the right patient and the right dose uh, to accomplish this. And uh, in 1995, uh, the RTPA study group uh, successfully uh, performed and published the results of a trial that did exactly that. Um, a few trials prior to this one had looked at giving it out, giving the drug out as many as six hours from the onset of the stroke. This trial limited the treatment only to those who presented within three hours of the beginning of their stroke. So this is a pretty tight window, uh, but they demonstrated that uh, given in that time interval, patients were more likely to recover at three months. Uh, about 12% more people were functionally independent after their stroke with the treatment than they were without. So another way to look at that is about uh, for every eight patients that are treated with this drug who meet these criteria, uh, one of them will be functionally normal that wouldn't have been otherwise. Now this didn't come without a cost. Uh, about 6% of the people who were treated with this drug did have bleeding inside their brain and about half of those got worse. And so uh, although that, that trial uh, was a landmark trial that led the FDA to approve the drug for treatment of stroke, partially in light of the fact that there was essentially nothing else available, it was not accepted wholeheartedly. And I think that was for a couple of reasons. Uh, one of them is I think just the inherent nature of this drug was that we could both measure a, a a very likely benefit to some patients and a very likely harm to others. And granted the balance was in favor of the patients who benefited, uh, but yet I think there's sort of the general discomfort of the idea that I might actually hurt someone trying to help them with this drug. So I think there was kind of a philosophical barrier to its uptake. And then there were also a couple of problems that uh, were pointed out about the trial, uh, the most serious of which was just by random chance, it so happened that uh, more minor strokes happened to be treated with the TPA therapy as compared to the placebo therapy. Uh, and as a result of that, it raised some question as to whether or not maybe it was the milder strokes to begin with that led to this treatment effect. Uh, this became a, a hot controversy in medicine that uh, actually is one of the reasons I became interested in stroke when I was a resident uh, because on the one hand, neurologists were gung-ho uh, all the way about giving this drug any time it was possible, and emergency physicians, several prominent ones, were, uh, were the loudest voices pushing back against this drug. And part of that was uh, underscored when Cleveland uh, printed a paper uh, of their initial experiences giving TPA where they had a number of protocol violations and a large number of bleeds in the brain. Um, so because of this kind of combination of things, in the first decade after this drug was approved, fewer than 4% of stroke, pe stroke patients actually received the drug. Uh, and so the receipt of the drug, interestingly, was very different depending on where you lived. In general, if you were near medical centers that were associated with medical schools or tertiary care centers, you were much more likely to get this drug than if you presented to a rural or community hospital. But the variability was all over the map. And so uh, this kind of led to a, a big uh, series of 
kind of evidence-based medicine fights in the world in the world of medicine, trying to prove or disprove the function of TPA. And so meta-analysis was one of the main sort of weapons that was used either to try to undermine or to reinforce that TPA did what it was supposed to do. Uh, there were also a number of large registries established to try to look at the safety and e efficacy of the drug. Uh, ultimately, uh, I think those that were, that what seems to be clear now after looking at, you know, hundreds of thousands of patients being treated is TPA works about as well as the original trial said it would, which is to say fairly good, but with some downsides. So the other way that uh, that stroke care was advanced was by shifting the focus away from uh, the, the sort of content pathophysiology of, of medicine and looking at the system around medicine in order to deliver care better. And so this idea of a chain of recovery uh, after brain attack, which was a, a stroke uh, renaming that didn't stick, uh, was to look at uh, patients recognizing their symptoms, activating the healthcare system, uh, having emergency departments ready to evaluate and treat the disease, uh, provide good care in the hospital and rehabilitation following. And so uh, this led to a number of public health initiatives to try to raise awareness about stroke you know, uh, in the in the 80s and 70s, if you had a stroke, whether you showed up in two minutes or, or two days didn't make a real big difference in terms of how the hospital treated you, but now there was a drug available. EMS kind of rose to, to prominence in the evaluation of stroke patients because transport by EMS was associated with earlier treatment or better care. Uh, in the emergency department, an interesting thing that happened that I, I think is probably a more potent example of this than just about in any other condition we treat is that the process of delivering care became the centerpiece of intervention. So um, in, in order to give TPA, there's actually a lot of steps involved. You have to identify a stroke, you have to get a history, you do kind of a standard neurological examination, you need IVs, CAT scans, CAT scan reads, discussion with a neurologist, talk with the patient about whether or not they want it, you need to actually mix the drug, which comes in a powdered form, so it takes a really long time to do this stuff and, and emergency departments were doing it really slowly, partially because they had some ambivalence about giving it and partially just because it's hard. Um, one example of the way process kind of became central is thinking about how patients are handled even when they hit an emergency department door. In general, patients hit the emergency department door and they get taken back to a room somewhere in the department and then a team comes and evaluates them there and they say, oh no, it's a stroke. And then they would put them back on the gurney and they would walk them back around and they'd go get CAT scans. So this led to unnecessary motion and rework. And so process improvement measures started to develop to try to streamline the evaluation of stroke patients and sort of minimize some of this unnecessary logistical uh, difficulty. Uh, some interesting data that comes out of that also is uh, it highlighted how clinicians a lot of times think they're doing better at something than they actually are. This was a funny, not maybe it's not funny, but it was a, something I found a little bit amusing. It was a, it was a uh, survey of emergency departments and they were, they were asking clinicians how often they gave TPA within the recommended time frame of 60 minutes. And their estimates were really high. They were all convinced that they were doing it, but their actual data proved that they really weren't close to, the, to as good as they thought they were. And so this is another instance where the, the pathophysiology of medicine and even the clinical decisions of medicine weren't the issue. Uh, and so uh, systems were developed uh, in part externally by things like the Joint Commission and the American Heart Association to try to draw in expertise from outside of medicine to improve the process of care. And this quality improvement uh, movement was something that was informed a lot by uh, business type quality improvement methods like lean thinking and Six Sigma and uh, PDSA cycles. And it, it really came out of manufacturing with an idea that what we need to do is identify every little step of the process and then improve them so that we can achieve a more consistent performance. And uh, although I don't think this is the best model to think about everything that happens in healthcare, I think it really was uh, a huge benefit in the care of stroke patients. And so uh, by sort of implementing a series of educational and feedback bundles and sort of reorganizing protocols and how care gets done, 
consistently, hospitals were able to demonstrate that they could give uh, treatment to stroke patients much, much quicker when they had an organized process. And in fact, looking at this on a national level, uh, these graphs show the, the likelihood of stroke patients getting treated within the recommended 60 minutes of arrival. You can see that right around the time of initiation of these efforts, which is collecting registries, giving feedback, initiating quality improvement programs, there started to be a dramatic improvement in the care that was delivered to stroke patients. Uh, and not only did they get their TPA faster, but more patients were also treated during that same period. And not only did we get better numbers, but uh, it also was clear that we were getting better outcomes. So the hope was if we could get this drug to people faster and we could get it to more of them, that we would improve stroke outcomes. And indeed that is what happened. We've seen stroke mortalities continue to decline. We've seen more patients uh, recover and we've had actually lower incidence of uh, complications like bleeding, bleeding in the brain from treatment. Uh, and so I'm starting to skip through here a bit because I know I'm getting close to the end of my time. <clears throat> so the next phase of evolution of stroke care uh, addresses what about people who don't do well with this clot busting treatment? It turns out that when the clots in the brain are, or in the blood vessels are very big, they don't respond that well to the uh, Drano solution. And so if you've got, you know, Barbie doll stuck in your pipes, you can't dissolve it with Drano, you got to go in after it with a, with a drain snake. And so that's kind of the principle that has guided the next level of stroke treatment. Basically, what we want to do is identify a blocked cerebral vessel, put a catheter in, not unlike the cardiologists do in the heart, and remove that blockage to restore blood flow to the brain. Uh, this is called mechanical thrombectomy. And on the grand scale of things, this is a pretty, pretty recent uh, innovation. Uh, this was uh, something that was conceived of in the 70s and developed during the 80s and 90s, but only anecdotal evidence really supported it. And then the first round of trials that everybody was waiting for were published in the 2012-2013 uh, uh, range, and they were negative. And it sort of shocked the stroke world because we all thought this was the next big thing. And so it kind of reforced a reevaluation of what, what did we do wrong with these trials? And one of the biggest problems was that people were already treating people. If they thought they were a candidate, they were just treating them with this therapy rather than en enrolling them in these trials. And so it created a lot of uh, ambiguity and a huge effort. Five, five different trials were started as a result of this. And a short two years later, all five of those trials, which are held in brackets here, showed that in fact, this inappropriately selected patients, uh, this therapy does have dramatic benefit. And these are individuals whose outcomes without treatment are extremely poor. So this was good news for stroke treatment, but introduces a whole new level of difficulty because now, not only do we need to be in a center that has a neurointerventionalist who can actually perform the procedure, we also need special fancy imaging. So regular CT scanning is not usually used to screen for this therapy, uh, but rather CT scanning that is combined with a contrast dye that measures the perfusion of the brain. So basically we inject contrast and then we take pictures over a period of time to see how long it takes that contrast to get in. And then that can help us identify this area of salvageable brain. So this is not available in every hospital in America. In fact, it's, it's a relatively small percentage that are able to do it, which means uh, that regionalization of stroke care is now becoming the, the, the focus of many stroke systems. That is to say, trying to determine which hospitals patients should go to when depending on the severity of their stroke and the likelihood they have this disease, it can only be treated at a, at a comprehensive center, which is the type of stroke hospital that is capable of producing or doing this treatment. Uh, it, it forces us to think about who goes where and when, and how do we get as many people as possible access to the treatment that they need. And so this is just one example in our own area. In Nuego County, where I practice, if a stroke happens in the southern end of Nuego County, historically, an ambulance would respond and they would go directly to Gerber Memorial. It's the closest hospital. But if that patient needs this advanced stroke therapy, it might make more sense for them to go directly down to a hospital where that treatment can be delivered, rather than stopping off at a hospital we know can't treat them. Um, 
And indeed, there's now a growing body of evidence that suggests that if we delay this treatment, we do harm patients. They get their treatment much slower, and that slower treatment is also associated with less good outcomes. So uh, the study that I'm involved in right now is, is trying to answer the question, can we ask paramedics to differentiate who has this type of stroke and select their destination on the basis of that? Uh, this is just a map of our area sort of highlighting the opportunity that we have where uh, a driving, a comparable driving distance might, might get somebody to stroke treatment faster. So with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw to a close and uh, suggest that there's a lot more to be done in the area of stroke. If you're heading into medicine and, uh, and this is of interest to you, there's definitely room for more good ideas. Um, Improving access to care, reducing disparities are sort of challenges for epidemiology. And there are a number of uh, things that are ongoing looking at neuroprotection or even at neurorestoration, helping the body recover from a stroke. So a great many exciting things are, are undoubtedly on the horizon. And I will stop there and be happy to entertain any questions. So thank you, Dr. Usma. Uh, really appreciate your your uh, presentation very thorough background history and uh, leading up to some of the, the latest uh, treatments uh, that are available so we do have a few questions in the q a um, I will read them off if others uh, have questions feel free to add them into the q a and um, we will try get get to all of them so the first question is, I know someone who had a bi bilateral basal ganglion stroke. How can the stroke occur in the same location on both sides of the brain, even if it was due to hypertension? Could this be related to structural defect in the vessel? Uh, yes, it could be. Um, there, so that particular location is kind of interesting. The basal ganglia are where um, hypertensive strokes are off, often you know, occurring. And so it is conceivable if this was a hemorrhagic stroke to bleed in both, although I would say that is quite unusual. Um, some people have microvascular disease or AVMs that might make them more prone to getting bleeding. Um, there are also certain circumstances, for example, profound hypotension. So if somebody was really sick, for example, and their blood pressure were to drop terribly, uh, that can also cause infarction in the basal ganglia that might be more bilateral. We call it more of a watershed infarct. So it almost makes me wonder if that, uh, that could have been the case there. So it is not typical um, to have strokes on, on two sides at once, but it can happen. Uh, I see another question about AFib causing stroke. Uh, AFib itself doesn't cause stroke, but AFib uh, leads to, fibrillation refers to basically a disorganized contraction. So normally your heart beats top and bottom in sequence and in effect empties uh, the, the atria of blood each time it squeezes. In atrial fibrillation, the, the atria starts to have this disorganized contraction where it's not really squeezing or emptying. And so blood stagnates within the atria and clots form and then those clots can migrate into the ventricle and then they can shoot into the body and they most often will head into the cerebrovasculature and cause a stroke. Uh, let's see, I, I'm just picking whatever's at the top of my list. Is that okay, Mark? That's great. Uh, I had a TIA in 2019. I do not feel much different. I don't remember all the tests I had, the hospital. Those are, uh, I have weakness on my entire left side, not noticeable until I'm tired. Yeah, so a transient ischemic attack or a TIA is a really interesting thing. So that, uh, that term was coined by, uh, by uh, C. Miller Fletcher, actually, uh, the neurologist I mentioned, and it represents uh, symptoms of a stroke that resolve within a day. That was a clinical definition. This is from the days before imaging. We now know that the majority of people who have transient neurological symptoms like that do have small areas of infarct in their brain. Often you can identify them in an MRI, which is a technology that I didn't even mention because I ran out of time. Um, but uh, the symptom you describe where you can, when you're tired, uh, 
you may notice some recurrence of that symptom is what we call recrudescence. And it might be that there was a small infarct in your brain that you normally you compensate for, but when you're weakened or tired, or sometimes when people get sick, those stroke symptoms will tend to occur more because the brain is sort of not able to compensate as well. Uh, let's see here. Back to the pie chart, different types of strokes. Where would cryptogenic strokes fall and how do cryptogenic strokes happen? So a cryptogenic stroke means a stroke that we don't know the etiology for. Most cryptogenic strokes are ischemic strokes. So they're in the pie chart, they would be in the ischemic part of the stroke uh, pie chart. Uh, but, the, but what differentiates them from other strokes is that we don't know why they happen. So a good number of strokes fall into that category. Uh, if we discover that someone has atrial fibrillation, we often conclude, oh, it must have been a cardioembolic stroke. If brain vessel imaging identifies a clot within the brain, say, aha, that's the cause right there. But for many individuals, we can't say what it was. And so oftentimes we'll do a more protracted workup. Many people with crypto, excuse me, cryptogenic stroke wind up having AFib, but they just don't realize it. Maybe as, as many as a quarter of people who have an ischemic stroke of cryptogenic origin, if you trace their heartbeat for the next six months, you'll find out they do have AFib. Uh, let's see here. Is the left brain more susceptible to stroke than the right brain? I had a mini stroke 10 years ago and recovered marvelously. And the last uh, close your eyes, try to the brain. You know, I used to know the answer of whether or not one or the other was more common. I don't know that for a fact, but I will say this, strokes on the left side of the brain causing white, right-sided weakness and speech difficulty tend to be more obvious. And so strokes on the right side of the brain can be more subtle, more likely to be missed both by patients and by clinicians. A lot of times it doesn't interfere with speech and many times it might present with more confusion type symptoms. Um, and so I don't know if statistically speaking, left-sided strokes are more common, but they are typically more obvious. Um, let's see here. Hi, can you address uh, the treatment of lacunae stroke? Yeah, la lacunae stroke are kind of an interesting little subgroup. Another C. Miller Fisher contribution actually. Um, Lacunar strokes refer to very small strokes that occur basically in the microvasculature of the cerebral cortex most often, or uh, as a hypertensive complication in the basal ganglia. And a lacunar stroke, interestingly, uh, doesn't seem to respond to things like TPA in the same way that other strokes do. And so the treatment of lacunar stroke in the acute setting, you know, if qualify, we still treat with TPA, but they don't qualify for that endovascular treatment that we talked about. And it's usually more about risk factor modification, uh, trying to make sure that we control hypertension, control diabetes, mitigate the, the difficulties that are leading to those types of strokes in the first place. Um, in the acute setting, uh, an interesting little tidbit about lacunar strokes is sometimes laying down will improve the symptoms because it increases the blood flow to the brain a little bit and sitting up will tend to make them worse. That's just a little medical oddity for you there. Uh, let's see here, I have memory problems, often immediate recall or missing words. Uh, could this be a symptom of stroke perhaps is the question there. Memory problems, I would say are not a classic stroke symptom but people with hypertension, high cholesterol, diabetes, who are getting microvascular disease, just as it impacts your heart and your nerve endings and uh, can cause problems elsewhere, it also causes problems in the brain. And so things like microvascular dementia and so forth might contribute to problems like that. Um, sounds like something that's worth talking to your physician about. My sister had a stroke and was told that impacted all four quadrants of the brain. I'm not sure what that exactly was referring to. Um, all four quadrants of the brain. No, I don't, I don't have any great insight into that one. Maybe it was kind of that Galenic uh, cell theory thing where I, I'm not sure what they were intended to communicate there. My guess is they miscommunicated. Uh, let's, it, it's, uh, I believe she just wrote it was on both sides. Yes. Okay. I don't often talk of the brain in quadrants, 
more often in halves, although you might think of the posterior elements of the brain as their own entity. And Dr. Usma, I, I do have chat open as well. I, I see somebody asked the oh. question, do migraines cause small CVAS? Oh, that's an interesting uh, question. I Short answer, not sure. There is an association between those two things. We think that migraine headaches uh, have something to do with cerebral vasospasms. And it has been documented that people who recurrently get migraine headaches will sometimes have changes on their MRI, not unlike having small strokes. Um, so whether or not really bad spasms might cause tiny little ischemic injuries in the brain is possible. Um, typically not the, yeah, not the kind of strokes like that might come to your clinical attention, but contributing to this sort of microvascular problem in the brain potentially. And Dr. Usma, I, I see another uh, kind of question in the chat. Um, can another session be done strictly addressing treatment and rehabilitation after a stroke? I'll say, I think that's a great suggestion. Um, I think maybe Dr. Usma is a emergency doc that might, I, I'm not- I'm not, <laughs> I'm not your speak for you, for but, that, but I do agree that's a great topic and there's a lot of interesting stuff to talk about there, but somebody in PNR, PM&R or, uh, or rehabilitation medicine would be, a, would be a great talk. And what helps people recover is actually a whole, there's a whole world of stuff to talk about there. Sure. And I, I see one more in, in the q and I'll, I'll read it for you a second. I had a chemotherapy, anthrocylic, would this contribute to memory issues before the TIA? Um, I, I'm not super familiar with that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to say for sure. Almost all chemotherapies have certain amounts of kind of cerebral negative impact. I mean, chemotherapy is a really hard thing to take. Um, so neurological symptoms are not uncommon among chemotherapeutic agents, but I couldn't tell you about that one specifically. And I see another one in chat. What is the relationship between sleep apnea and stroke? Uh, I'm not aware of a strong relationship between those two things. Um, sleep apnea is pretty well correlated with coronary heart disease. And so it wouldn't surprise me to learn that somebody has drawn a link between that and stroke. Um, it's not something that I think of as high on the list of risk factors, but sleep apnea seems to contribute to uh, problems with hypertension and recurrent hypoxia. And those two things seem to cause vascular damage. And pretty much anything that causes vascular damage can lead to heart disease, cerebrovascular disease, those other things. So I, I don't, I guess I couldn't say for sure how tight that link is. It wouldn't surprise me to learn that there's at least some association. Okay. And then let's take this as our final question as we went a little bit over time tonight, but obviously for a great reason. Uh, can you speak about global transient amnesia? Oh, transient global amnesia is a very interesting clinical syndrome for those who don't know that um, consists of essentially uh, a short-term memory loss, usually for a day or less. Uh, I've seen patients who are like in from out of town who are just driving their car around and they don't know where they are or why and they show up in the emergency department, for example. Um, the reasons for it are not clear. It's thought to be related to some type of migraine-like vasospasm phenomenon. It is sometimes the case that when you do an MRI on a person who's had transient global amnesia that you will find some little ischemia in the area of the brain that uh, impacts memory, um, but that isn't always the case. So um, it's not considered to be a stroke per se, but, um, but certainly may have something to do with cerebral blood flow. Blood flow. Well, I see one more question came in. I have a relative who had this happen three times. Okay, so that was maybe a follow-up to what you were just wow. talking about. Yeah. Hopefully they're seeing a neurologist somewhere to see if there's, I'm not sure what can be done about that, but that, I don't know that I've ever seen anybody who's had it more than once, but then I don't meet many people twice. Well, with that, Dr. Usma, I want to say thank you so much for your time and, and, uh, 
you know, working through uh, a few laptops to make sure that you're able to join us uh, within a couple minutes of the eight o'clock hour. Um, I will just mention, I, I did put it in the chat for those who were able to join us live. We do have two upcoming lectures. Uh, the next one is in two weeks on Thursday, March 10 with Dr. Sean Valles. When it comes to your health, does zip code matter more than genetic code? And uh, then the next uh, virtual lecture after that uh, is with Dr. Ryan Thomas on Thursday, April 14, and he will be talking about asthma. Um, again, I added a link to the upcoming lectures in the chat. I think most of you that have joined us virtually uh, probably received an email from me today. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to try to answer them uh, via email as well. So I guess with that, Dr. Usma, I really appreciate your time. Thank you for being part of the Your Health Lecture Series. Again, thank you to our co-sponsor uh, at Aquinas College, uh, uh, Sister Damien. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your help on this. Um, and of course, I would uh, like to thank my employer as well, Michigan State University College of Human Medicine for making this possible as well. So Dr. Usma, Sister Damien, thank you and have a great evening. Thank you, Dr. Ustuma. Well, that was wonderful. Time. And thank you, Mark. All good right. Night. You take care. Have a yeah. good night.